Mr. John Barber, ladies and gentlemen. John. Most critics I know really wanted to be actors, uh, with the possible exception of Rex Reed, who wanted to be Myra Breckenridge, <laughs> and succeeded. <laughs> I, uh, I came from a broken home. Um, my mother wanted to uh, put me up for adoption when I was a fetus. And coming from a broken home, what I really wanted was attention, you know, and I spent all my spare time at the corner theater sitting in the front row staring up at those huge faces up there in the screen and the theater would be filled with the sounds of love, you know, coming from the couple sitting behind me. <laughs> and I wanted to grow up and, you know, be one of those huge faces up there in the screen, so... I could get a better look at the couple sitting behind me. <laughs> but I lived thousands of miles from Hollywood and I knew I could never become an actor, so I decided right then and there to become a critic. So I turned around and told the couple what they were doing wrong. <laughs> Fellas, I said. Many times I felt I inherited my father's bad luck. He'd bought a uh, cemetery plot and then drowned at sea. <laughs> my poor father actually failed at everything he ever tried, you know, and every business he ever went into, he went busted. Then one day, he saw a documentary about the abominable snowman, and he began thinking that if he caught that thing, he could go down in history as perhaps another Darwin for catching the missing link and naturally he could make a fortune like Barnum or Todd, you know, charging people to see it. Well, he became so obsessed with this idea. One day, we woke up and we found that not only he deserted us, left the family, but he'd taken all the money, all the insurance, everything that he could cash in. Well, we found out when he got to India, he hired 10 of the toughest India Sherpa guides that he could find, and he set out looking for the abominable snowman. They climbed the Himalayas, and when they'd been out a few days, half the guides ran away. When they got to about 20,000 feet, the temperature was 20 degrees below zero, and the remaining Sherpas froze to death. Well, my father was about to give up when all of a sudden, the next morning, he got up, and outside his tent, there were the tracks of the abominable snowman. And all of a sudden, these images of fame and wealth were conjured up in his mind. With, so with the adrenaline pumping, he went out after it, and he caught the abominable snowman. And he took it down the mountain, and it melted. For weeks, it was very depressing watching him sitting in the basement, staring at a bucket of hairy ice water. <laughs> he drowned, trying to give it mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. I met one used car salesman, he's probably the best salesman in the world. He could sell a vasectomy to Truman Capote. <laughs> I don't, uh, I don't, you know, want to brag or anything like that, but I drive the world's most expensive automobile. I drive a $28,000 1973 Chevy. That's how much I put into it. I've had it three months. The mechanics had it three years.
I haven't seen the USA in my Chevrolet, but I've seen every mechanic. <laughs> you know why they built those three auto plants in Detroit? It's right next to Pete's Body Shop. <laughs> the paint is the original color. <laughs> I use three quarts of oil a day just to keep the doors from squeaking. <laughs> the only thing that works in my car is the lighter. It gives off a constant flame. <laughs> it's got an automatic choke. You get in, you automatically choke. One day I was driving to Los Angeles from Pete's Body Shop. <laughs> and I stopped for a hitchhiker. He wanted out. <laughs> and one day I was pulling into a gas station, which is unusual because Ordinarily, I'm being pushed. <laughs> I send the attendant to fill her up, and he says, I'm sorry, we're out of wood. <laughs> I used to hear that American cars were built and timed to fall apart. That's not true. They can go at any minute. <laughs> Watergate was something that may have put America on the brink of democracy. <laughs> After Watergate, they took a, a survey as to the trustability of the 20 top professions in this country, and that survey showed that politicians were the lowest. They ranked number 20. And they were one notch lower than used car dealers. <laughs> it's been so hard for politicians to sell us in the future, they may have to get a used car dealer to do it for them. Ha, friends, this is Cal Worthless, a worthless used candidates. <laughs> Located in Orange County, just 15 minutes from civilization. I'm so anxious to make a deal, I'll stand in my head and smoke your exhaust. <laughs> Here's the 1975 Jerry Brown Datsun. That's son of Fat Brown. This here single-seater model's the cheapest one around. <laughs> Can be had for a song. Linda Ronstadt got it for one. <laughs> Everything about this model's original, except the ideas. <laughs> So it can stick to the middle of the road better than manure to a cow's tail. <laughs> now to the right of that, we got a special two-wheel drive, the 1970 George Wallace Plymouth Fury. <laughs> Faster than a school bus. <laughs> Only comes in white, white wall tires, white vinyl interior, and this white protective sheet. <laughs> Next to that, we got this 1975 experimental Ford hardtop. 
comes equipped with a roll bar, wrap around bumpers, and one of those test dummies still behind the wheel. <laughs> Now, there are a lot of dents on the body. <laughs> and a previous owner was a clumsy Quaker from Whittier. <laughs> now, to the right of that, here's the one. We got the 1968 Nixon Tax Dodge. <laughs> Drums and soil, red, white, and blue. Corner's fantastic, cause it just can't go straight. <laughs> and on the dashboard is this plastic statue of Rabbi Corp. <laughs> Well, be like Sammy Davis Jr., folks. Come on down here to Cal Worthless and give this Nixon tax dodge a trial hug. <laughs> Left of that, we got a quick preview of the 1980 Kenley Cadillac with a completely new feature. It floats. <laughs> Here we got the 1976 Carter Southern Triumph with stained glass windows and a bumper sticker that says, Honk if you love Jesus. <laughs> and in the back seat, a water bed in case you want to commit adultery someplace other than in your heart. Have you ever noticed that during moments of crisis, the news never talks English? Yeah! <laughs> That's one of the reasons that problems don't go away in this country, is that when a problem becomes a crisis, the government doesn't try to change the problem, what they do is they change the problem's name so that when we hear it on the news, it doesn't sound like it's a problem anymore. <laughs> there are 40 million people in this country who can be classified as poor, but they're not called the poor anymore. Now they're referred to as the limited income group. <laughs> How would that sound in the Bible? Blessed be the limited income group. A panhandler is no longer called a bum. Now he's disenfranchised. <laughs> and if you have a child who fails in school, he's no longer a failure. Now he's an underachiever. The more he fails, the higher he underachieves. <laughs> so you couldn't say something like a poor dumb bum's kid failed miserably in school today. You'd have to say something like a junior member of the disenfranchised limited income group is a high underachiever. <laughs> Sounds like the next J. Paul Getty. <laughs> and we can no longer say that a man is impotent. Now we have to say he's a senator. <laughs> I started on the uh, NBC News, uh, the six o'clock news in Los Angeles as a critic, working with Tom Snyder. Tom was the kind of guy that would come on and give you the impression the news was there to bring you him. <laughs> I've been barred from three studios for some of my reviews. I was 
barred from Paramount for the first review of The Great Gatsby. I said, now I know why they're thinking of charging six dollars, three to get in and three to get out. <laughs> I was barred from Universal for a review of, I did of Jesus Christ Superstar, in which I referred to it as Fiddler on the Mount. <laughs> The most difficulty I ever got into over a review, though, was at NBC over a review I did of the Jerry Lewis Telethon. They call it the Jerry Lewis Telethon rather than the Muscular Dystrophy Telethon because someday they expect to find a cure for muscular dystrophy. <laughs> at one point, Lewis came on and said he was there to help correct God's mistakes. <laughs> See, God built the world in six days, and on the seventh, Lewis told him what he did wrong. <laughs> anyway, the, the closing line of my review was that they had raised $18 million on the telethon, but maybe they could have raised twice that amount if every person who never wanted to see Jerry Lewis again sent in a quarter. <laughs> The next day, one woman called me and she says, John Barber, I'm never going to watch you again. After this, I'm only going to watch William Buckley, because at least he's not opinionated. <laughs> and one angry NBC executive came into my office and said, Hey, Barber, could you do what Lewis does? So I looked at him for a moment and went, so he gave me a quarter. <laughs> Once I took what is advertised as a uh, special champagne flight to Las Vegas. Everybody gets champagne when the crew's finished with it. <laughs> we were out about 15 minutes, I guess, when the intercom clicked on and a voice said, is this a Swiss of worth this thing? <laughs> Good Monday morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Captain Murdoch speaking. Your test pilot. At takeoff, our regular pilot opened the door and took off. She was a dog anyway. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you aboard this exciting three-engine Boeing 707, which is fast becoming America's most exciting two-engine 707. <laughs> Our airspeed is 600 miles per hour. Our altitude is 15 feet. <laughs> if you look out the right window, you'll see a deserted Navajo village. If you look out the left window, you'll see the Navajo's deserting. <laughs> A bird was just sucked into our starboard jet. So was the cat that was chasing it. Just outside Las Vegas, we miss one of America's most fantastic tourist attractions, the Hoover Dam. But not by much. <laughs> we 
he's sure to be arriving in Vegas Tuesday. <laughs> the temperature there is 61 degrees. The air is clear. And the skies in a cloudy all day. <laughs> Your stewardess will be by to bring up your lunch just as soon as she finishes bringing up her own. <laughs> the others are busy reading Fear of Flying. <laughs> Thank you for being with us and Next time you fly, be sure and take this exciting single-engine Boeing 707. <laughs> Does anybody on board know how to handle a glider? I was encouraged to become a comic by Red Fox, the father divine of filth. <laughs> He's the only person I know who actually tried to make an obscene phone call to the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. <laughs> I met Red about... Uh, a dozen years ago, back when Sammy Davis Jr. was a Negro. <laughs> and then Sammy later embraced the black identity thing, and he was black until he embraced Judaism. And he was Jewish until he embraced Nixon. <laughs> Now he's a Negro again. <laughs> Red, though, is the only one I know who, after he became successful, actually tried to do something for his people. When he became a star, he didn't move into Watts or Harlem. He moved into Toluca Lake, California. And the following day, went next door to Bob Hope's house and tried to free the black jockey on the lawn. Not a statue, a real black jockey. <laughs> a few years ago, the New York film critics made a, a big deal and a hit out of a movie called Death Witch, which sounds like a documentary about Peter Bogdanovich and Sybil Shepherd. <laughs> In that film, it have us believe that Charlie Bronson goes into Central Park waiting to be mugged. <laughs> King Kong wouldn't mug Charlie Bronson. <laughs> I mean, one look at that face, a mugger would look at it and say, oh, excuse me, sir, I see you've already been mugged. <laughs> I studied karate for five years, and uh, I want you to know I speak it very well. <laughs> oh, that breaking the boards, that's not karate. The grunting, that's karate. The breaking the boards just helps you to speak it like, uh, uh. <laughs> That's karate for, why am I hitting these boards? <laughs> the 
It's very effective, too. I mean, supposing you're walking down the street some night, some mugger jumps out of an alley, pulls a gun, and she says... All right, buddy, give me all your money. I mean, if she's standing three or four yards away, what good are your hands or your feet? Except to reach into your pocket and throw them the money. But if they jump out of an alley and pull a gun and they're a few yards away and they say, all right, buddy, give me all your money, and you say to them in karate, I'm not going to think you're smart enough to have a whole lot. <laughs> In karate, there's one basic stance you assume. You spread your legs, you extend your arms and spread your hands, and you bend from the waist. You assume this stance right after you've been kicked. Every night when I come home from a movie, I always make it a point to take my dog for a walk. But not once I've ever come home and taken my mother-in-law for a walk. <laughs> and it just occurred to me, if I took her, it would be a whole lot less trouble. <laughs> for one thing, I wouldn't have to carry around that scooper in the brown paper bag. I know scores of people like myself who say they won't take dirt from anyone, can't wait to follow a dog and pick it up with a bag and a scooper. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that you can buy food for people with stamps, but you gotta pay cash for kennel ration? During the Vietnam War, we heard of American and Vietnamese body counts accompanied by pictures of mutilated men, women, and children. But not once do I ever recall seeing a picture of a wounded guard dog. The news didn't show us pictures of mutilated guard dogs because Americans consider cruelty to animals inhuman. If we'd seen a dead guard dog, that would have been the Six-Day War. It seems our brother's keeper has become dog's best friend. So I have a little advice for you. If eight junkies with knives ever hold you up and you're in fear of your life, never holler for help. Bark. <laughs> Doris Day and Betty White would kill them. Many times I've gone into a club or watched television and ended up listening to some performer expounding on his or her philosophy of life. Oh, I don't go into a club or watch television to listen to that because people I know who usually spend all their time talking about their philosophy of life are too busy talking about their philosophy to have a life. I do have a philosophy of life, which I'd like to tell you about. That is that the the good things that happen to us always seem to happen by accident, while the bad things are always so well planned. <laughs> the new television season was well planned. Barry Lyndon was well planned. The committee to re-elect the president was well planned. The swine flu vaccine was well planned. The Edsel was well planned. The Vietnam War was well planned. But the good things happened by accident. I mean, it was only an accident that Christopher Columbus discovered America. It's only an accident that All in the Family is on CBS. It was done twice as a pilot at ABC and turned down. My son is an accident. <laughs> So if I say anything that you find interesting or amusing, 
it'll be an accident. <laughs> if not, it's because my act is very well planned. <laughs> Recently, I spoke to a woman's group, the Beverly Hills chapter of Hadassah. Beverly Hills is America's best, most model integrated community in that it's 50% Jewish and 50% their colored help. <laughs> I spoke at the Wiltshire Temple, a beautiful building with colossal golden arches. It looked like an Orthodox McDonald's. <laughs> Billions pledged to date. <laughs> anyway, the woman in charge stood up to introduce me, and I thought she was going to say something nice, like they usually do at these functions. Instead, she says, I hope Barber is better than the last newsman we had here. I mean, what a male chauvinist pig he was, giving us the impression the only thing we really are for our husbands are sex objects. John's supposed to be here to talk about the changes he's seen in the news. Well, he better realize things have changed. I mean, here I am standing in a synagogue, and unlike my mother, I'm not wearing a dress, I'm wearing slacks. And I'm not wearing artificial makeup, it's natural. And I'm not wearing a bra. And all the women applauded and cheered, and then she says, anyway, here's John. <laughs> well, when I got up, I felt like Earl Butts at an NAACP convention. <laughs> first thing I did was assure them that I didn't consider them sex objects because as I looked around the room, I didn't see any who qualified. <laughs> it's interesting because before getting up, three other women also told me that they weren't wearing bras. And when I tried to change the subject, uh, asking what kind of men their husbands were, the first one said, my husband's an accountant. And the second one said, mine's a lawyer. But you know, that's not what I asked them. So I wanted to get a little more personal information from the third one, so I asked her, what color are your husband's eyes? And she says, he's a blue-eyed engineer. <laughs> now, women condemn men for putting them into one category of sex object. But to them, men are known only as occupations. <laughs> and now, I concluded my talk by observing that perhaps basically not much about men and women has really changed all this time. In the first time, 10 years ago, that I met my wife in San Francisco, and we were going to go out on a date, and I went to her house and picked her up, she told me she wasn't wearing gloves. Maybe women who say they aren't wearing bras have the same intentions today. Because my wife said she wasn't wearing gloves because later on she wanted me to hold her hands. <laughs> ABC is paying Barbara Walters a million dollars to tell us about inflation. <laughs> We've become so conditioned to accepting only bad news in our lives that that's all we'll pay for. And the worse the news, the more we'll pay for it. <laughs> Anchor people in this country make exorbitant salaries telling us how bad the world is. We pay doctors a fortune to tell us how bad our bodies are. Psychiatrists get rich telling us how bad our psyches are. We make authors wealthy who tell us how bad our sex is. <laughs> Ralph Nader became an institution telling us how bad our products are. <laughs> Oral Roberts and Billy Graham built multi-million dollar religious organizations telling us how bad our souls are. We become so conditioned to that 
accepting only the bad, that if somebody came along and tried to tell us there was something good about us, we'd kill them. <laughs> I have a dream. <coughs> Ask not what your country <coughs> do unto others. <coughs> You really know how misplaced our values are when you realize that Billy Carter gets 10 times as much money as his brother, the President of the United States. We all know he's only worth twice as much. <laughs> Billy's doing everything he can to sell his Billy beer. But every time he opens his mouth, it sounds like he's full of Schlitz. <laughs> anyway, I would like to leave you with the philosophy of a famous American communicator. Rona Barrett. <laughs> who said, if you can't say something nice about somebody, a lot more people will listen. Thank you.